Yeah, it's not that you learn by asking people questions, but you find your own answers and you tell the answers to people. You know, the world will not know the answer. You will be the sort of you no know, one among the few who will have found the answer. Okay, that's the joy of discovery you know, in some sense. Hello and welcome back to The Frontier, a physics series where we have conversations with researchers in the domain of physics about their fields, why they do what they do, and their journey with science. Today we have Professor Amol DK with us. He's a theoretical physicist and a professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. Professor Amol's research interests lie in the areas of high energy or particle physics, uh, specifically neutrino physics, astroparticle physics, uh, collider physics, and physics beyond the standard model. He is also involved with the phenomenology group at TIFR. Uh, Professor Amol, after studying the engineering physics uh, degree at IIT Bombay as part of his bachelor's, uh, went on to pursue his master's and PhD from the University of Chicago. And before joining the faculty of TIFR in 2003, he was a postdoctoral researcher at institutions such as ICTP, CERN, uh, and the Max Planck Institute. Uh, he is now a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and in 2013, he was also awarded the Tanti Swarup Patnagar Prize for Science and Technology, which is uh, known to be a really high science honor in India. So, Professor, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. I've seen some of your old podcasts, and I must say they're really nice. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, would you like to say a few more words about yourself? Uh, well, I uh, I like doing physics, and that's the reason I'm in this field. Um, I like uh, teaching. I like discussing physics. Um, I like thinking about mathematical aspects of physics, about how physics is useful in practical life, and so on. So it's it's a good life to have as a physicist when uh, you, your job is your passion. Sometimes. Yeah. So as always, we do want to start start with standard questions, uh, beginning with why you chose physics, what, what was it that sparked your interest and then what motivated you to stick with it? Okay, uh, a tough question, but let me put it like this. So uh, I, of course, was I in the school. See, all, all mainly depends on the school and what influences around you are. Uh, if you get uh, teachers who teach you in an interesting way, you tend to get interested in the subject. Um, I fortunately really got some very nice uh, teachers in mathematics and physics. So initially, of course, I was attracted, I was attracted more towards mathematics and I did try doing that. Um, at some point, I realized that you know, it requires the kind of rigor for which perhaps I do not have the patience. Uh, so then uh, that sort of brought me towards physics. And uh, uh, physics, of course, it was a combination of, uh, of mathematics, but it also involves looking at real world. I think uh, that's what attracted me more towards doing the kind of thing that I do. That it is not just sitting in a, in a room and you know, writing equations and solving them. No, that's of course great fun. But at some point of time, you figure out the consequences of what you are doing and look around you and try to explain the phenomena that you see around. So that, that uh, sort of brought me into physics. And what kept me into physics is mainly the things that I kept on getting nice opportunities and uh, uh, yeah, kept on having fun. And uh, since I could do that, I, I guess I just continued with it. Okay, so, so within physics, also there are quite a lot of choices. So, so why did you end up working in, in fields like high energy or particle physics? Do you have any answer for that in hindsight? Um, I can actually think of something that is uh, uh, something that happened when I joined my graduate school. Uh, I did my uh, bachelor's from um, IIT Bombay, which was in engineering physics. And I went to the University of Chicago without really being clear about what it is that I'm going to do. I was quite open about this. Of course, I didn't know much about what all goes on in the field. Um, I would say there were two stories that, uh, that happened, which sort of took me to particle. Um, one story was, uh, say, in our first year, we used to have these uh, talks no, by, uh, by professors telling us about what field they are going to. And there was this talk by, I remember, Professor Bara, who at that time was uh, doing experiments at Fermilab. 
So Fermilab was at that time the biggest accelerator in the world, you know, like CERN is now, for example, so large hadron collider. So that time it was Fermilab. They were building this uh, world's largest accelerator. And they were trying to solve the problem of uh, why is it that in the world we have more matter than antimatter? No? So why do we see uh, protons with electrons going around them, but do not see antiprotons with uh, positrons going around them? And uh, since in that time, my knowledge was kind of bookish, for him, right? I, I knew everything that was in, in, in my quantum mechanics books, but I said, okay, then you learn from the books and you know the answers. Um, here, you suddenly are come up with a question to which you did not know the answer. No, why did this happen? And, uh, you know, so uh, I asked uh, a question after this talk, uh, you know, saying that, okay, but you no, know, who will tell us the answer? And the answer that came back was, what do you mean, who? We are the ones who will, who will tell the world the answer. No? We'll be the first ones to know the answer because we'll do the experiment. So that was the first part which sort of told me that no, it's possible to do something that in some sense I had not imagined before. That you know, it's not that you learn by asking people questions, but you find your own answers and you tell the answers to people. You know, in the world will not know the answer. You will be the sort of you no know, one among the few who will have found the answer. Okay, that's the joy of discovery right, in some sense. So that was one spark which told us that okay, maybe here is something that we can do. Uh, the second thing that uh, that interested me uh, was because of um, one experimental physics course that we had to do in Chicago. Uh, now, now you must imagine uh, that this is the city of Chicago, which is wintering extremely cold, 20 below zero kind of. Year. So you don't really want to go out; you want to sit inside. And there was this sort of experimental physics course that we had to do, uh, which used to be called the basement course because you, know, you go in the basement lab and uh, just take something that interests you and, and work on it. Uh, so there are these old experiments and in the junk, I actually found out an experiment which was done in 1970s, whose uh, no, sorry, results were kept there in the form of some uh, nice uh, slides, no? the photographic slides. Now these were experiments done in, uh, in bubble chambers uh, long, long ago. And there were photographs of bubble chamber pictures. So I don't know if you know what bubble chambers, if particles pass through the chambers, they leave tracks, you know, and you can see what's happening. So, um, so I said, okay, this looks interesting picture. I tried to figure out what these pictures are of. It turned out that people in the university at that time did not know how, how these pictures are obtained. So we actually went back and found out that this was some old professor in the university who now had actually taken up paleontology. Uh, by after retiring. So we actually located him. He came back and explained to me how these things were done with techniques of 1970s. And you no, know, if you if you ever look at particle tracks in the bubble chamber, you will be able to recognize particles as if they are faces of your friends. Okay, so so these two things sort of combined to get me into particle physics. And uh, the rest is uh, in just details. Okay. So so how much of your your Final trajectory that you've taken over the years in all these explorations. Uh, do you believe that were shaped by you, and how much were sort of not under your control and just by external influences? Uh, I don't think anything was under my control. Really. Okay, so you must also realize so practically uh, that uh, research in physics is a career in physics. In, in some sense, uh, difficult and unpredictable uh, thing. Okay. Uh, firstly, of course, a large number of people want to do physics. Not everybody can, uh, can get to do a PhD in a good place. Uh, the number of uh, postdocs available after PhD are also limited. Um, and it's not that you can jump from topic to topic. You commit to a topic and in your PhD, you have to work on that topic for, let's say, four or five years continuously and hope that you will get something positive. And that you know, in addition to you, know, you doing hard work and you know, the field being interesting and uh, sort of growing, you also need some bit of good, good luck. Okay? So it, you, everything needs to come together. So it is very difficult to chart your trajectory. If you had asked me when I left IIT, for example, where is it that you want to spend your 10 years? Uh, maybe I would have told you something, it would have been completely wrong. Okay, so I did not plan my trajectory. What I did was at proper times, uh, I looked for good opportunities and took those opportunities with sort of uh, interest in you know, that uh, those I think would be good. And you know, those things change at intervals of almost every couple of years. 
Okay, so I, I did not only change the, the place I was going to be in, I also changed the topics I was working on you know, because working on one topic is boring. It, it's good to work on, on multiple topics and you, you go to a place where you will be able to learn new topics uh, the right time. I got the right opportunities and uh, I, I managed to manage to go to those topics. So completely not in my control. Okay. So um, over the years, uh, it seems like you have definitely worked on several research interests, but uh, what was your very first uh, experience with research? My very first experience with research, as I said, it started with the experiment in Fermi lab. And uh, I started actually working on experiments, uh, although right now I spend a lot of time being here. Now, remember what was happening. This was a big experiment called as Trevetron, which was being built at that time. And it actually meant working hands-on. Uh, there were older experiments of Fermi lab uh, whose uh, experimental uh, components had to be recycled. You, know? you have to take out all the old cables, put them into new experiments. There was this uh, new detector being tried, which has uh, crystals of uh, cesium iodide. You have to actually clean them, polish them, and uh, uh, make into a detector. So although I worked on that for a uh, relatively short period, it made me appreciate the fact that you know doing theoretical research on pen and paper is not the only thing. You actually have to, you know, in some sort of say, go get your hands dirty and you know, do the, the work that actually goes in constructing something physical. And that I think has stayed with me, even though I work mainly in theory, I appreciate exactly what goes on in making an experiment. Um, so this was my first experiment, exper experience with actually doing you know, interesting research kind of physics. After that, of course, I, I drifted slowly into doing theory, but theory as a not very, very pure theory, all my theoretical research has always been connected with what data experiments give you, or for example, you know, can you build new experiments, or at the same experiments, can you take different kind of measurements if you take the measurements, can you do different kind of data analysis to get things of your interest? Um, that's where I've been going to. And uh, yeah, so although my topic changed, the nature has sort of stayed the same. The nature of connecting in experiments and uh, you know, with theory and somehow trying to bring them together. Yeah, so I definitely do want to come back to this kind of interface of theory and experiment. Um, but for now, I want to ask you, um, you mentioned that you always liked uh, math and physics in the beginning. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, mostly in our in our education, at least in India, um, we're, we're exposed for the most part to theory uh, more than experiment. So, do you believe? And, and ultimately, you said that what what sparked your interest was was some experimental uh, aspect to physics. So, do you believe that we should uh, try and include more more exposure for for to experiment? especially when it comes to studying subjects like physics uh, in our early education? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's always been my, my yeah, uh, big thing to tell people, for example. See, in schools, uh, I think uh, at the school level, the, the time taken for experiments in lab, for example, is actually very, very limited. Okay. And I won't say it to schools, I'll say even at the college level, even at the bachelor's level. I think it is very important that uh, students, especially the physics, understand that knowledge is not in books. Okay? The knowledge is in actually doing things and figuring things out. Okay? Yeah, it's no fun, well, it is fun, but it's not as much fun uh, to first do calculations and then verify it by doing experiments. Okay? Probably more fun is that you do experiments without really having a great idea about where it's going to lead to. Uh, do the experiment, look at the data, and figure out where it could have come from. See, doing research is uh, not uh, uh, writing down answers that from your head, right? Uh, doing research is a creative process. And a creative process means that you see something new, you ask yourself the question, how could this have happened? And you come up and try to think about ways of, of doing this. And 10 different people could come up with, uh, with seven different ways, and one of them will be correct. So being wrong in physics is actually uh, as important as being right because well, you throw away that one way of not being right. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I think that uh, experimental parts of physics and really working with things, no? taking making instruments, 
taking things apart, no, unscrewing things, and no, connecting them again, uh, should actually uh, be encouraged at uh, all, at school level, college level, and so on. Uh, we see, of course, lots of students who come to, uh, to TIFR to do their PhD. And we do find that many of them have not had exposure to uh, experimental physics. As a result, what happens is everybody comes and wants to do theoretical physics. Yeah. However, uh, no, note that, especially in the place like GIFR, where the facilities for experiment, you know, experiments is, is so strong, uh, suddenly we have a large number of people who have no clue about what it is that is, is there. Uh, see, doing experiments is also a very really fascinating thing. And yeah, I think it's not emphasized in at least Indian education as much as it is. And uh, yeah, I think it should. I do make a point to say this you know, wherever I go. Yeah, and that's definitely a good point to raise here as well. So coming back to your connection with physics, uh, uh, what is one thing that you've grown to personally appreciate more about physics over the years? Um, over the years, uh, uh, well, one thing, as I kept on saying, is uh, the truth is not in the equations. The truth is in what you see around it. So that's, that's one thing. It's, uh, uh, the second thing is uh, uh, creativity is important, but all, all should also keep it in check by comparing with data. And data is, is, is very, very important. Okay. So of course, you can do lots of uh, speculations and you, know, you can uh, you know, fly in the air, you know, soar in the sky, so to say, but your feet should be on the ground uh, because whenever you think of a great idea, you should also think about how can I test the idea? How can I how can I verify the idea? Um, and of course, one thing that uh, maybe uh, I thought when I was uh, now of your age, but now I don't, is uh, at that time I thought, oh, physics should have answers to everything. Uh, no, there should be nice answers to everything, no, not just your answers. No, the answer to a, a problem in a question should be a nice function, no, sine x plus d times cosine x, like that. And now I find that no. Most of the problems that you solve do not have such nice answers. In fact, uh, even in the theoretical research we do, we uh, do not expect to find nice analytical answers to everything. We have to do a lot of numerical uh, exercise. You know, that has become a part of it. It's not something that I thought of when um, I was uh, doing my undergraduate. But now I know that uh, not all questions can be solved by simple analytical answers. There, is, there are also numbers involved. And uh, numbers are important. Yeah, so um, a, a lot of what you've uh, said right now and before throughout the podcast seems to be um, like quite aligned with the spirit of, of science, the scientific method, um, especially what, what you're talking about. The physics is actually what you see around you and not just the equations. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about phenomenology now. Uh, can you explain uh, to the viewers uh, what, what phenomenology is? Okay. Uh, so phenomenology, in some sense, is the uh, study of phenomena. Right? So in, in physics, uh, uh, because it's a very, very vast subject and uh, things are quite specialized, what normally happens is uh, there's a set of people who are hardcore mathematical physicists. Okay? So they are, they are the ones that uh, are great at mathematics and try to work out equations. So that is one part. They build theories. Okay? So I'm also partly one of them. I also build theories. What does building theories mean? You start with certain assumptions, you look at the consequences, and you say, okay, okay, the world will therefore behave like this. So that's that's a part of it. These are, there are a set of people who are uh, predominantly experimenting, so who actually do the experiments and see you know, what's what's happening. Okay. So phenomenologist is a link between these two. Okay, so what do you do? So you work maybe in two directions. Okay, one is you say, okay, uh, I have my theory, how do I test the theory? Okay, so I say, okay, I have maybe I have uh, theory one and theory two, and uh, one of them must be true, one of them must be false. So I should compare these two. Uh, if I want to figure out which is true, which is false, what should I do? Uh, what experiment should I do? Uh, whose results will tell me one is true and two is false? Uh, what kind of data I analyze to figure out if one is false and two is true? So one job of phenomenologists is to do this, okay? to suggest experiments which can distinguish between theory one and theory two. You know, this means both, right? This is understanding of theory, understanding of what experiment can practically do. Okay, you know, if you if you tell the experiment to do something that they cannot do, it's, it's no fun. Okay, so that is one way. 
The second way is experiments have data. Now we look at the data. We say, okay, from this data, can I now find out whether theory A was correct or theory B was correct? So this is the way you collect uh, you know, the speculative, uh, creative part of, of theoretical work and the real down to earth part of experimental work with the real data. So connection of these two is made by you know, this uh, set of people called the phenomenologist, uh, among which I consider myself. So that's what I try to do, you know, connect these two things. It gives you experience of um, doing both things you know, and uh, somehow uh, yeah, connecting the two worlds to make sense out of how things are happening. Yeah. So, so how much of it is theoretical and how much experimental, very roughly? In, is it really 50-50 or? Yeah, so I, well, so I personally do not do experiment. Okay, I, mean, I think experimentalist friends of mine have uh, learned long ago that uh, uh, I, they should not give me things to play with. It's, it's quite dangerous for the things that I play. Um, however, uh, the way I'm close to experiments is in the sense that I use the data that experiments produce and I can interpret the data. And I suggest experiments, suggest ways of analyzing data. Sometimes I also end up suggesting you know, how to do the experiment. And uh, fortunately, some of my favorite lectures have some trust in me and use that to do their own analysis and I come up with um, So most of my work is, of course, is theoretical. I, I, I build theories. Um, I try to find out consequences of theories because that's important. A theory can, of course, give you a consequence that you want. It could also be a consequence that you do not want. Okay. So uh, it could give a pretty, it could tell you that, you know, uh, okay, wonderful. Uh, if, if this theory is true, then uh, uh, whatever, the, the, the tides have to be exactly this height. Okay, wonderful. But the prediction of the same theory is that, you no know, tides have to be very weak on the new moon day. Then, of course, the theory is wrong. So when the theory comes, uh, your job is to take all the all these consequences and check that everything is consistent with what we have now. Because remember, I mean, uh, we have been storing data or collecting information uh, for thousands of years. So there has been data which people collected about stars for different thousands of years in the laboratory, at least for a few hundreds of years. And uh, whatever theory we propose has to be consistent with everything that is known so far. And no, not just taking the small corner and say, oh, I want to solve this problem. Let me put you know, B equal to five and I have an answer. No, that's not true. You have to be consistent in everything that has been about thousands of years. So that, that part is, uh, is very good. So a lot of my uh, work actually is in this, looking at theories, looking at consequences and seeing whether they are consistent with whatever we have, uh, we have done so far. So how much room for creativity is there in, in this kind of work? You did allude to there being some kind of innovation aspect involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. So creativity comes in again uh, two or three aspects. So one is a simple way to look at it is you know, if you are doing proposing a new model, you have to be creative. Okay, you have to come up with certain uh, certain conditions. Of course, when I say model, it's, it's normally a mathematical model. Okay, so you have to know some amount of mathematics, but come up with a with a model which is a mathematically consistent way of explaining things. Um, and then to see what, what consequences. Getting from model to consequence itself has a, a creative aspect to it because you know uh, a model can have many consequences so it, in a ways that you could never have thought of. Okay. So for example, uh, let's say tomorrow you, you come up with a model which says I have a new particle called as P and that particle is the universe. Okay. You have this great model. And you say, okay, so this model you know, looks like my dark matter. Okay, and you say, okay, wonderful, great model. But now you have to think, you know, uh, what will it do to the solar system? Uh, will Earth's rotation period stay the same? Will tides stay the same? Will sun stay the same? Uh, what will happen to Jupiter? What will happen to our galaxy? What will happen if I have a detector which was going to detect something? Why wasn't this particle seen there? Uh, what happened to cosmology? What about the Big Bang? Uh, what happened to the hydrogen fusion, which makes helium inside stars? Uh, no. So uh, the fact that a simple thing I proposed that which are the particle P, 
uh, already has consequences over what we see in the sky and about which we know, we know all of this. It could have effect on nuclear reactions. We know what nuclear reactions. It could have effect on how um, conductors behave. No, if this particle goes in the conductors, can it conduct electricity, for example? That could be a question to ask. So literally, there are uh, infinite kind of directions by which you can think when you start with the theory. Yeah, so that is another uh, interesting. The third part uh, is the next part, which is connecting the consequences with experiments. If you want to see what experiments we can conduct, it's not that you can design a new experiment for everything, because you know, experiments are expensive. Experiments need equipment. Okay, uh, lots and lots of money to build it. A lot of people who want to build experiments. So you have to think about what is practical. Yeah. What kind of thing will give you maximum amount of benefit? Yeah. You don't want to you know, find one quantity to a precision of one in a million. Okay, maybe that is too much. Maybe your experiment can find 10 different quantities to 10% precision. And that might be a useful thing to take physics forward. So all these things come in the aspect of creativity. You know? What is creativity after all in some sense? Um, although, of course, the origin is unknown, but what creativity does is it tries to connect uh, two things which a priori might be thought as unconnected. Right? The creativity is the connecting, connecting these two parts. That Newton's creativity was in connecting the fact that uh, uh, what apples fall down the earth and planets go down the sun. And these two things, a priori, look very, very different, but uh, he showed that uh, gravity will explain both of these things simultaneously. So that is creativity. Uh, yeah, that that uh... yeah, that, that is extremely well put, sir. Um, yes, yeah, so I do want to point out one thing though. Uh, you've used the words right and wrong many times in our conversation already uh, for theories, etc. Et um, and and in the past we have had a few theorists, uh, the kind of hardcore mathematical physicists you were speaking about, who are quite defensive of, about this and, and say that. Um, the correctness of a theory is not really determined by an experiment. So uh, they say that some, uh, you, you you make a set of assumptions and then you work under those assumptions. And so if, if your theory turns out not to match with experiment, then you can't call the theory wrong. You just say that probably those assumptions that it worked under or, or some of the calculations, there's two components, either of those could be wrong. Uh, but just because it doesn't describe uh, reality doesn't mean that it's it's uh, it's wrong per se. So so what do you have to say to that? So I agree to that for a mathematical theory. Okay. Mathematical theory is if your axioms and you do your mathematical way, you get the correct answer. Right? If x, then y. Uh, but I try to go a step further and ask: Is this does this theory correspond to our world? So when I say use the word right and wrong, right and wrong has many, many meanings. But the, my, the meaning I ask, I, I assign to it, is does this correspond to our world? Okay. So theory is not wrong, but does it correspond to our world? In this case, it is not interesting for me. Okay. So I'm interested in finding out how the world works. That is some of my main motivation. Okay. People will have different motivations. My motivation is to find out what exactly happens in our world that, that we observe. And in that sense, my when I say theory is wrong, it doesn't mean that this mathematical framework or structure is wrong. I mean that it doesn't correspond to our world. And that also means that if it doesn't correspond to our world, I cannot really test it you know, by doing experiments in our world. So I say, okay, okay, I mean your theory is perfectly okay, but I would like to test a theory which corresponds to our world. That is my interest. And in that sense, that is the right theory for me. And that's the theory that I mean. So, so how much of, of uh, this correctness that you're speaking about, uh, this is more of a personal question or like on, on some kind of philosophical level. Um, whenever you, you, in the context of correctness that you've spoken about, whenever you find that a particular theory is correct, uh, how much of it do you personally believe is true? Like how much of it is actually uh, something that we're seeing in nature versus how much of it is just our way to look at it as a model? See, this is of course a part of whole philosophy of science that all the conclusions that you have are always tentative, right? So you always say, to the best of our knowledge, we know these theories too. Okay. So of course, all the answers that we know are in the context of a model. Now, here one has to make a detailed distinction, which is the uh, how well do we 
have we tested this model? Okay, so, so look at the example for the standard model of particle. Or let's forget that. Let's take quantum mechanics. Okay. Now, um, quantum mechanics is a theory or a model, you can say, which has been tested by literally thousands and thousands of different experiments. Okay. And therefore, you put really a lot of trust in, uh, in quantum mechanics. So this is a framework within which you act, right? So in, uh, in any time that you have to work, you have to work in some framework. Even in doing mathematical physics, you have to be in some axiomatic framework where these are objects with which you deal with. Deal with and, uh, um, sometimes, of course, you have to be like a Schrodinger's cat in the sense, no? You have theories one, two, three, four, five. You don't know which is correct. So you say, okay, if A is correct, this is happening. B is correct, this is happening. And you're not sure if any of those five theories is true. So you suspend your belief, right? You say, no, I will believe it when something comes, which will give me some evidence to, uh, to believe this. So, yeah, so at this level, um, I, uh, yeah, so I think that uh, there are some theories that you believe simultaneously, although they are, have different predictions. But the reason for that is because those predictions have not been tested. Okay. Once you test the prediction, then you open the what is the box of Schrodinger's cat and you know which theory is to be and which not to be. Uh, but till then, you live in a, in a superposition of a possible belief in, in many uh, alternate theories. So, I mean, I do want to make one particular uh, point, uh, I guess, question that I want to ask you. Um, for, for fields that you're working in, or, or in general, like quantum mechanics, fields that you can't really see, um, the world around us, we have a specific set of in, intuitions about how things work. And so we can personally believe things to be true in, in, in such a context. Um, but even when you say that the superposition is collapsed and you know that one theory is correct, um, are you able to develop some kind of intuition that, that is uh, sort of like an analogy to the intuition that we see to the physics around us on the macro scale. Uh, yeah, actually, yes. So that, it, it, that is in some sense a part of uh, training in physics. Um, we know now that a lot of things that we observe, especially in quantum mechanics, are very, very non-intuitive. Right? Uh, human brain over you know, many, many years, billions and years, did not develop to understand quantum mechanics, right? It's, it's something that we know only for the last 100 years. So, so we don't have, we do not have intuition to this. Uh, one of the things that you learn when you do physics is to unlearn your intuition, keep your intuition aside, okay? And trust in the mathematical framework that you're working with. Uh, when you do this many times, you do develop an intuition. So it is not that quantum mechanics is non-intuitive per se, it is non-intuitive, but uh, you develop intuition about quantum mechanics also, because you, know, you look at its consequences and you imbibe what are, what are these. So for example, you know, um, uh, hundred years ago, if, if you had said that uh, uh, hydrogen atom has uh, discrete energy levels, okay, not continuous, people would have not had intuition to do that. Okay. But I guess, uh, no, once people are convinced that quantum mechanics is correct, it seems to work. I think even people in high school or undergraduate, they will have the intuition that, oh, okay, fine, hydrogen atom, those, whatever those shells are, have discrete energy levels. Okay. So similarly, when you work in a field for a long time, you do tend to develop intuition related to this field. Uh, a large part of uh, training to be physicist is in some sense uh, keeping aside our prejudices and uh, sort of accepting the things that uh, uh, quantum mechanics or relativity, which are as I say, both are very very counterintuitive, has actually given us. Okay. So yeah, it, it comes. With, uh, you you might say that oh this is just uh, something that you learn over years. Uh, it is true. You learn it over years. Uh, no, we don't claim to have. Uh, understood things uh, at the deep level, for example, in quantum mechanics, the measurement problem is still unsolved. But that's okay, we keep that in a black box. We know that in spite of not understanding exactly what happens there, we can make very, very accurate predictions 
Yes, at least the working knowledge part is good. And you can develop intuitions, rules of thumbs about working knowledge of uh, working with uh, quantum mechanics, for example. We can develop uh, intuition about the relativity, for example. No? You know, the discussion I uh, was having with uh, some old friends who are not physicists just a uh, you know, couple of days ago about, uh, you know, if somebody is sitting with a charge and you know, somebody else is moving, uh, will the other person see electric field or magnetic field? These are interesting questions. No? And um, you might have realized if you have done this, that initially when you're looking at it, the answers look very counterintuitive. No? But uh, once you understand you know, relativity a bit, electromagnetism a bit, you understand what happens to electric magnetic fields when charges move. So in that sense, you, you learn about these things. So, so is it the role of science to actually understand, you, you alluded to the measurement problem and all, is it the role of science to actually understand and interpret all, all these kinds of theories? Or is, is the working knowledge that you require for making predictions and all, is that, is that enough? Is that, is that where science's job should end? Um, or, or should that also be a frontier that people pay, should pay a lot of attention to? No, no. I think science's job is to explore wherever things can be explored. Uh, so therefore, it is important that there is a set of people who like doing this thing, you know, who have working knowledge and who can work with this. Uh, take the example of uh, chemistry. That we do now. now, essentially, most of the atomic molecular chemistry that we do is quantum mechanics. Okay? Uh, chemist, I'm not sure they do not, but they don't need to have a detailed knowledge of, you know, let's say, measurement of your quantum mechanics. It's not needed. Okay? They know the way. working knowledge of quantum mechanics will tell you very far in doing good chemistry. Okay? Also in good atomic physics, for example. Uh, so you don't need to insist on that. Okay, So in that sense, you know, physicists are different from mathematicians. Uh, physicists can take something as a black box and say, okay, I assume that this is true, and no, I, I will work with it. On the other hand, you also need people who work on this foundational issue. No? What is measurement in quantum mechanics, for example? No? Uh, no, what happens during the collapse of a star and formation of a black hole? No? How do you describe uh, information inside a black hole, for example? These are foundational problems. Okay? Without them, you can perhaps explain the world around us, but you do need to understand where it came from. So you need people at, at all these fronts. Uh, no, it's actually good that all of us have different interests, right? We will not be fascinated by the same thing I'm excited about. You know, some people like doing mathematics, some people like doing experiments, some people like connecting. So it's good that people have different interests. And I think uh, science should explore these things from all frontiers. It's, uh, yeah, not just one. Yeah, that's great. Um, so now we can uh, move into the topic of uh, your own research interests. Um, so would you mind uh, very briefly outlining the things that, that you're current, uh, currently interested in? Uh, okay. Uh, so of course, my, my main interest springs from my initial interest in particle physics. So particle physics is some of my means. Now, what does one do in particle physics? Uh, the particle physics originally, of course, grew uh, by looking at cosmic rays, which had been elementary particles, and you, you found new particles at the new particles. And that, as you know, developed into the standard model of particle physics. The way we normally try to test the standard model is uh, by having colliders, like large hadron collider. You collide objects, new particles are formed, you have detectors, so these are properties. So one aspect of uh, my work is to look at this, which is called a collider particle physics. So you look at what about the colliders, look at their data and study properties of new particles. So like the Higgs boson, which was discovered ago, for example. Look at their properties, try to see what experiments you can build to study its, you know, more of its properties and so on and so on. Um, we know that standard model of particle physics is, uh, well, to use uh, the word that we used before, wrong. Okay? Uh, well, wrong in the same sense that, uh, that Newton was wrong, because uh, what was wrong? Well, incomplete. Certain uh, in certain areas, the answers were not made. Um, it's incomplete. We know that it doesn't have answer to certain very really basic questions, like like why is there matter than antimatter? Why is there more matter than antimatter? It doesn't know why there is dark matter. Doesn't know what is dark energy, for example. So there are questions to which you don't know the answers. You know the answer is incomplete, which means that there must be more particles that we see right now, 
but uh, we have not been able to see them for some reason. Maybe they were never produced. Maybe they were there, you no, know, a billion years ago, but have vanished. Okay, but they may have left some footprints uh, in the sky somewhere, and you have to find them. So this is what we call as a search for beyond standing molecules. It's possible that these particles, which got decayed long, long ago, and you cannot see them, maybe in the collider when you, you know, collide proton and proton, maybe they will be produced. No? Because as as we know, energy can be converted to mass. So we can maybe produce those particles and, and look at them there. So this is what we call as searching for new physics. Uh, any theory that the standard model which is very successful has to be tested all over again, all the time. Okay, you cannot, otherwise, otherwise it becomes a book which you believe, right? You don't want to believe in a book. You want to believe in the real world and data that it gives. So continuous testing of standard model from various aspects is very good. To find uh, signals of new. So that is one aspect of my work. The second aspect of my work has to do with understanding the sky. Okay. This is what I call astroparticle physics. And again, this is uh, looking at particles that come from the sky, because again, I'm, my training essentially is a particle physicist. So I look at particles that come from stars. Okay. Of course, the whole world of astrophysics looks at light coming from stars, light coming in radio waves, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet uh, rays. I am particularly interested in looking at the particles called as neutrinos. Okay. Uh, sun produces lots of neutrinos. All the stars give off neutrinos. And the question that I ask is, you know, whether if you look at neutrinos coming from the sky, whether they can teach you more about particle physics, standard model, whether they can teach you more about astrophysics, whether they can teach you about, about stars and so on and so forth. So overall, my work is in, in these two areas. Uh, we can go into details if you need later, but I guess initially perhaps this part is fine. So something that happens in colliders, very, very small scale. We are actually looking at things which are uh, uh, no, much smaller than a nucleus. On the other hand, we look at astrophysics, which are stars, which are like 100 times the mass of the sun. And turns out that the laws that govern them end up being the same. That's the reason that a person like me who knows only those laws can work both at subnuclear size and also at uh, you know, very, very big size like uh, stars and galaxies and so on. So that's the kind of thing. That, uh, so how blurred is this line between uh, study of the small like particle physics and uh, astrophysics? Uh, I don't know whether to call it blurred. There's no line at all in, in some sense. Uh, so we know, for example, now that uh, stars shine because of nuclear reactions. Right? So look at the sun. Okay. Now, um, about 300 years ago, when people tried to Kelvin, for example, tried to think about how the sun shines, and Kelvin thought uh, maybe it happens because it has gravity and it converts gravitational force to uh, energy. Right? And he, of course, was a great physicist, so he did calculations. And he said, oh, but if that happens, the sun would uh, basically vanish in a few thousand years, but it did not happen. So he himself said that, no, this is really not correct. We understood. So remember, we haven't looked at the sun for, I don't know, since the mankind was born, right? Uh, but we know about nuclear reactions in the sun about 100 years ago. So 300 years ago, we didn't know about nuclear physics. So we know that sun shines because of nuclear fusion uh, from last 100 years. So what does this mean? This means that a big body like sun you want to really understand it, you have to understand nuclear physics. And these are basically small particles. Yes. What we learned only about uh, 50 years ago is that uh, if the sun, these reactions happen, it will give out these neutrinos that we talked about, no? these particles. What we learned 10 years ago is these neutrinos uh, have some strange properties and they convert from one type to other. Nobel Prize that was given in 2015 was for basically this, right? So it essentially it taught us how the sun shines. So even a, a big body like the sun, which we have been looking at for you know, millions of years, was in some sense understood only about you know, 10, 15 years ago completely. And that understanding came from a study of particles that come from the sun. So I would say there's no, no blurring like that at all. To understand big things, you do need to know those what. Yeah, so, so perhaps I should uh, reiterate the question in such a way. Um, you just explained that physics is kind of universal and you can you can use these laws of, that govern really small uh, interactions at, at the really small scales to explain 
these huge astrophysical uh, objects or phenomena um but perhaps i should reiterate the question in that um how how blurred is the line between the two communities that work as as researchers on on astrophysics and on particle physics because you you again are, are working on astroparticle physics which is kind of at the interface of these two so so is it is it that the like the, the culture of both these kinds of researches are really compatible or 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 how how exactly is it the line used to be quite sharp not many years ago it is only recently that uh, people have been talking across the field um i i have found that uh, the people who come from particle physics and people who come from astrophysics right actually find different problems interesting okay? uh in the last few years uh is you no know, maybe last decade i would say is when some um, people from on both sides of uh, of this line have started talking to each other and you would see that things actually have uh, the interface really has has grown down so i would still say that the field of astrophysical physics is very much in its infancy it's, uh, it's going to blow up very very soon not that people did not do astrophysical physics before i mean people particle physics of course started with cosmic ray it comes in astrophysical physics but uh, the fact that people trained in astrophysics and people trained in particle physics come together and solve problems together which cannot be solved by only one of them is a characteristic of our times it is you no know, since the last decade or so uh, so the number is relatively small as compared to number of people in, in both of these fields but you know it is like uh, uh, not two bubbles coming together no at some point of time this boundary will, uh, will break and things will burst together uh, in india especially the number of astrophysical particle physics is actually quite small and uh, i hope that it does grow in the next week it's kind of inevitable because uh, just like earlier in the last 50 years a lot of data used to come from particle physics because we build a collider and you know, every second you get uh, you no know, billions of events so it's not of data with the improvement in instrumentation of telescopes and various detectors in the last 10 20 years astrophysics and cosmology now give you that kind of data uh, in you no know, have started giving you know, so gravitational waves we never imagined we would see them 50 years ago now we know we see gravitational waves you no know, a few times every year um, uh, we observe uh, particles coming from the sky we observe very faint galaxies we observe uh, exoplanets for example this is all happened because people developed good instruments and uh, and therefore uh, particle physics are very happy when they get data okay? so now that a uh, good data that we understand from some particle from astrophysics also i think this interaction is going to be okay so um, if we do come back to uh, the work that you you were doing uh, as, as your research uh, interests in in uh, astroparticle physics um, it has to do with neutrinos as well right yes yeah. uh-huh. um can you explain how neutrinos uh, help us understand uh, whether there is uh, how to probe uh, physics beyond the standard model mm-hmm. okay so uh, so one example that i gave you uh, earlier was to understand how the sun shines right so uh, historically what happened is around 1960s when people started looking at the sun for finding neutrinos because it was predicted that you no know, sun gives neutrinos Uh, people build detectors and detected neutrinos coming from the sun because of course a great thing and in fact uh, nobel prize was given even for this particular story in uh, 2000 something or other um, but now turned out that the number of neutrinos that you gathered seemed to be too small uh, your theory should give you good quantitative prediction okay it should give you okay nuclear reactions you this much light this much neutrino okay you observe this much light therefore you must observe these many neutrinos so this is like a you know, sort of proportionality problem no you x has to i is no z has to the and the answer that was given by these calculations did not match the theory so it did not match the experiments experiment observed that number of neutrinos that you saw was almost half so what about these neutrinos okay so there were of course debates over the years 
some people say astrophysicists don't understand the sun. Some people said that experimentalists can't measure neutrinos. Some people said, no, something else is happening. Calculations are not. Uh, it was found out by work done by lots of people from 1960s to about almost 2000 that there is a reason behind this, uh, which has to do with the fact that the neutrinos of one kind, there happen to be three kinds of neutrinos. We may not go into details of that, but they are called as electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. Okay, just three types. And uh, sun produces electron neutrino, but on the way from the core of the sun to the earth, they get converted to other kind of neutrinos. And we don't look for them because we say, okay, sun makes electron neutrinos, let's build a detector that will for electron neutrinos. Of course, we really miss the other neutrinos and then you know, we are lost. The fact that neutrinos can go from one type to another is not a part of standard model. Okay. And the fact that experiments actually confirm this uh, phenomena called as oscillation from one type to other told you that something is beyond a standard. So this is a concrete way by which, by which the flows have really told us that there are ways of going beyond standard. The problem that earlier I mentioned about the matter, antimatter, asymmetry, more water, this antimatter, we don't know how that happens, but neutrinos provide one way of being able to do that. Okay? It's, a, it's a theoretical way, not yet confirmed, but it is one of those theories that you, know, you keep at the back of your mind saying, oh, this very well could be true. So yeah, so that's how neutrinos come into play. So so that's uh, particles come into play. Okay. So the, for neutrinos, uh, is it just the fact that they they undergo this kind kind of neutrino oscillation that that can tell us more about standard model, or is it is it some other property also that that is equally uh, people are equally optimistic about that can help us explore uh, more physics? Uh, well, neutrinos actually have many, many aspects, and one of them being that it's a neutral particle. Okay? Because it's a neutral particle, and uh, it has only weak interactions, it can go through almost everything. Okay? Now, what this means is that they can go through stars. And what it means is, if you produce something inside a star, uh, you can observe them from the core of the star coming out. And as a result, they can tell us about the environment they came from because the environment affects the way neutrinos propagate. Okay. So for example, even inside the sun, the neutrinos have been able to tell us things about the inside of the sun because you know, they produce them those in the core and they came out. Similarly, if you see neutrinos from other stars, you might be able to see what environment they came from. A very interesting environment on which actually I have been working for the last 20 years is the environment when a supernova explodes. When supernova explodes, things are happening inside a star, there are turbulences, no shock wave travels, star blows up, uh, very crazy things happen. Uh, now, a light cannot come from supernova to us unless the supernova actually explodes, okay? Because you know, otherwise, uh, the light will be inside the star. How can you see light inside the star? But neutrinos come to us from the star before it explodes. Now, what does this mean? If you want to look at a star before it explodes, you can see what's happening inside the star before it explodes, you can look at neutrinos and find out what. So this now gives us a handle at looking at places where earlier you were unable to see entirely. So what neutrinos therefore have done, they have opened up a new window for you. Now you can see inside the stars, which you could not earlier. So in that sense, they allow us to learn more about uh, astrophysics also, in addition to telling us about uh, about particles. So how much is this delay that you see uh, in this uh, arrival of neutrinos and then arrival of the light that, that will allow you to see the actual event happening? So it actually can vary between a few hours, like six hours to about a day or so. And this actually, you, know, you can imagine, has a very interesting consequence, uh, which is uh, no, neutrinos come to you first, and if you can figure out where they came from, we will know that in a few hours or maybe tomorrow, if you look at that part of the sky, you will see a supernova going. So it's like you no know, giving a pre-warning saying you no know, release of supernova movie tomorrow at 3 p.m. and then everybody looks at uh, looks at that direction. So this is what is called as a pre-warning of supernova. There actually exists a, a network called as SNUs, a supernova early warning system. It's a network of many neutrino detectors, and uh, if all of them see some neutrinos, that we are sure something is happening. 
Uh, in fact, uh, SMS goes to many people who are a part of this network. So, in fact, it goes to all the main telescopes so that uh, people can try to at that part of the sky, uh, supernova. So, we learn if tomorrow supernova happens in our galaxy, we are ready to look at it you know, from time t equal to zero and not wait till somebody else supports. Okay, so so just like how it's happened sometimes yeah. back in about a couple of years ago, not a supernova, but there's a phenomenon called as blazars. And there's a neutrino detector at the South Pole for ice cube. We detected a neutrino from that blazar. And after that, in the next few days and months, uh, many different instruments like uh, X-ray telescope or gamma ray telescope actually saw that blazar going off. So they had an early warning that this unpredictable uh, blazar phenomenon is going to happen in that part of the sky. Yeah, so, so actually, coincidentally, I was just about to talk about that for neutrino astronomy, uh, those kinds of events kind of heralded this whole field, right? So just like how uh, uh, you can access uh, more information uh, through gravitational waves, um, and that, that way you're extending yourself beyond uh, the electromagnetic spectrum for your observation. You, so you're saying that you can also look at another uh, kind of uh, quote-unquote spectrum is that the, the neutrinos that are coming to you. So it's providing even more access to the universe. It's a golden event. No, you look at uh, something in light, all the way from gamma rays, X-rays, UV, IR, to radio waves. You also look at it in gravitational waves, maybe there was that event. And you also look at it in neutrinos. So you've got multiple eyes to look at the event. And so you understand different aspects of what's happening inside the sky. Yeah, you couldn't have imagined doing this 50 years ago. Okay, so, so you did uh, allude to particles coming from the sky. Um, and I want to talk about uh, your involvement with the um, India-based Neutrino Observatory. Uh, so can you, uh, first of all, explain uh, what that observatory is? What does it do? How does it work and all? So India-based observatory, the Neutrino Observatory, or INO, is, is a proposed neutrino detector. Uh, it has been approved already by the government and it's going to be built very, very soon. So what is the specialty of this detector over everything else? Okay. So firstly, for people who will be interested in engineering, this will be the largest electromagnet ever built on Earth. Okay. It's going to be 50 kilotons in size, 50,000 tons or 50 million kilotons. It's an electromagnet, uh, which basically means that it has a lot of iron okay, and there's a magnetic field inside this. Now, what this does, as you know, if you have magnetic field, particles can bend. Charged particles can bend in the magnetic field. And as a result, although I won't go into details, what this detector can do, it can distinguish between a neutrino coming in and an anti-neutrino coming in. Okay, so this will be uh, perhaps the largest detector in the world, uh, which can distinguish between a neutrino and an anti-neutrino. So what this will do, is this will be a very passive detector. Okay, so you see that uh, neutrinos are produced in the atmosphere. They are produced by uh, natural phenomena all the time. Okay, so by cosmic rays come in and make neutrinos and they are being bombarded on the earth all the time. Uh, so this, this detector looks at those neutrinos and studies their properties. Yes, that is going to be the aim of this. And uh, the plan is to have it in, uh, in South India near uh, Madurai. Um, and uh, as I said, this, this will be the only big detector. It distinguishes a neutrino from anti neutrino. It can do things that other detectors cannot. So it is going to be one of the major uh, science experiments uh, in India over the, last, over the next many years. I mean, once it is built, it will actually run for a few decades. Yeah. Okay, so can you elaborate on, on uh, what is the hope for, for this detector when being able to distinguish between neutrinos and anti-neutrinos? Uh, do people have any kind of uh, expectations? Yeah, so this is of course uh, quite well known. Okay? It is quite well known that uh, the neutrinos come, uh, when they interact, they give particles called as muons and they can be detected. So in fact, uh, uh, a small uh, prototype of this detector is already built in Madurai. It's there, and in principle, no, if you can go there after a long time, you can go and see it. It's working. And uh, you can see muons in the detector. Okay. So the fact that 
the detector can be built, the fact that it can see muons, the fact that positive muons bend in one way, negative in the other way, uh, can be actually uh, seen at the detector. In fact, you could go to IONO website and sometimes you can see live events that happen there. So this is a proof of principle that has been shown that uh, this actually works. So we are very confident in that. Um, but in addition to that, we do want to go underground inside a tunnel okay, and build a lab there. The reason for that is that uh, with neutrinos that come from the sky, uh, lots of muons also come from the sky. And what happens is these muons overwhelm the neutrinos. So it's like finding a needle in a haystack. No? There are, for every one neutron that you can observe in the detector, there'll be one million muons. Okay? And then, of course, it's, uh, you can't distinguish it. The trick to avoid this is to go inside a mountain, no, it's the center of a mountain. Um, and then what happens is the mountain absorbs all the muons. Okay, but neutrinos interact weakly, so mountain cannot, cannot absorb neutrinos. So now you have a small cave inside a mountain, which has no muons, but all neutrinos. So now you can look at neutrinos in a very, very sort of pure and clean environment. So that is our next step. So once you build this uh, table, which will be sort of uh, a muon radiation free zone, then inside that we will put our detector and start taking it. So the big detector will be built inside this table and uh, hopefully it will start. Okay. And once it starts, uh, there is no doubt that we're going to distribute between and neutrino. And then, you know, the experience with the neutrino experiment is that you, of course, build it for doing something, but it ends up giving you something very, very different. Okay? So, for example, this uh, a big detector called Super Kameo Kande in Japan, it was built to detect proton decay. It never detected proton decay, but it found out the fact that neutrinos go from one type to other and actually got two Nobel Prizes for doing this. So, uh, yeah, once you have a very, very special detector, what it can do, even you cannot imagine. Okay, so um, now I do want to come back a little bit to, to this method of doing science that we, this discussion that we had. So how, how often is it that um, we see something unexplained and then try to explain it versus we predict that some, this is how something will behave and then we make an experiment to test that prediction? So, you know, making theories is very simple as compared to making experiments, right? Because you, know, you you can you can sit uh, for one week, think of something, discuss it, and come up with a theory. And it basically costs you nothing. As a result, uh, for every experiment you can do, there are hundreds, things, maybe more. So of course, what is what is very very common is uh, is coming up with theories. Okay. Now of course, some of the theories are not tested. Yeah, so that reduces the number of theories in some interesting form. Um, and therefore, uh, you don't know, for example, what kind of new physics is there beyond the standard model. And we right now maybe have I don't know, 15 ways of doing that. So what do you do? You know, which one, which line do you pursue? For that, you have to take guidance from experiment. So what people keep on doing, in looking at experimental data very, very carefully, and see that, um, okay, at certain places, I see something which is maybe slightly beyond channel. Let me see if that works. So experimental data often helps as a guideline to which direction theory should work, which direction theory should work. Um, I told you already that there are already open questions like matter antimatter asymmetry, dark matter, and so on. So we try to find out whether what we observe in experiments, as which is deviation from what we should expect, uh, can also work for solving our problem that we see now. So that's the way from which, that's the way in which the field of phenomenology currently works in. Uh, you try to see whether one solution can work for solving multiple problems. Because it's so giving one solution for one problem, no? why is there dark matter or in the particle P which does this? Is no point. Okay? Uh, you will claim to have gained some insight if one kind of new physics answers five questions that are answered. Okay. And that is always the way to look for this kind of thing. Okay. So for someone interested uh, 
perhaps our viewer one of our viewers interested in entering uh, these kinds of fields like phenomenology uh, what would you suggest uh, they could do to try and learn more about it okay uh, my answer might actually be kind of boring and the boring answer is uh, read books so read good books read, uh, read interesting books uh, I mean, some of the books that I found when, when I was in high school, for example, were these books by Ya Perelman. I don't know if they're even uh, available now. These are the new, new publishers. Uh, there are very nice books which are written at a semi-popular level for people who are interested in, in, in particle physics, uh, for example, and so on. Uh, the book, for example, written by uh, Weltman, Martinus Weltman, who got, also got Nobel Prize in around 2000 or so, about uh, very facts and fantasy, but something of that. Right? No, read such such books which give you a glimpse into what part of the things in life. And then after some time, no, don't stop there, but read some serial books, so, as in textbooks. Of the book. um, there are actually some quite interesting books, but there's no time to advertise for books that I like. But uh, uh, but of course, the, now that you have access, everybody has access to, to web, there are uh, quite a few good uh, courses, uh, course series, good uh, you know, webinars keep on happening. A good thing about uh, the COVID lockdown is that um, many institutions around the world have made their uh, uh, seminars and webinars public, so anybody can attend them. I think the idea is to keep your eyes open and get information from whichever place you can, you can get it. I think uh, sort of curious and active people will always find things to get information from. Okay, so, so uh, just to expand a little bit on, on this uh, discussion about how to learn physics, um, do you think uh, the way we learn it in, in uh, say there are, there are two schools of thoughts, we've had this kind of discussion on, on our podcast before about how uh, this kind of sociology of education um, how there's the traditional European way of first uh, acquainting yourself with all of the theoretical groundwork and diving into the theory and then uh, concerning yourself with uh, all of the actual real world applications of those uh, and uh, e even when it comes to working in professional research versus uh, the, the more Feynman kind of way where, where you start with a question and then you, you branch out from there and you teach yourself sort of explore by yourself these kinds of different uh, different different foundational uh, concepts that you'd require to actually answer this question um, do you do you have any personal uh, preference to to what kind of method you would suggest for people to to learn and, and be more passionate in general about about physics uh, there are different kinds of people right as i already said it is good that we are different kinds of people because both these ways are ways to make progress. Okay, extreme in any one of them will, will, uh, will stop your growth. Right? You want to understand everything in, in that's to understand and then go one step forward. So knowledge in physics is so vast that, that you will never take a step forward. Okay. On the other hand, if you, you know, jump on something, I say, I want to do this problem, uh, you won't, but I, I told you that uh, uh, for any new thing that happens, it has 100 consequences. You will not even think about you know, a particular consequence. So there's some middle path to be found. And it is good that there are people who work on both these fronts. It is good that people who work on these two fronts actually fight with each other and challenge each other okay, to, to keep them honest. Right? So the, the main part of uh, science is, uh, is being honest about your assumptions and what you put in. Um, so, um, I personally am perhaps more of the, uh, the earlier way you talked about. You, I don't know if it's, if it's to be called as European or not, but to try to understand many things and then take a step forward. But uh, but I don't think everybody does that. I think uh, there is uh, lots of nice things have been done by people who just jumped into things, came up with a suggestion, and then people like me try to uh, find out the loopholes in what they do. No? So this, this kind of thing also works. Science is not something that goes linearly. Science needs these two kinds of people who do their thing in two different ways and then you know, connect to each other and uh, sort of fight with each other and something nice in their of that. That's why it's, it's very important in science to surround you with good and interesting people. Uh, 
uh, and that's the importance of you know, being in a good place, as in a good university or a good institution is important uh, because I think uh, a physicist cannot grow by himself or herself. Okay, uh, or even a scientist, but I know a physicist. A physicist only grows in the environment. So you need that environment to, to nurture that person, to do that feedback, to, uh, yeah, so that the, the work, the quality of work actually, actually. so you do need, you need to do both kinds of people. Yeah, so that is a great note to end on. Uh, so do you have any final takeaways uh, for the viewers for this episode? If they, if they remember only one thing from this entire session, what would you want it to be? Huh. Um, well, uh, firstly, I would like people to say that they should do things that they like. Okay, and it's perfectly okay if you don't like physics and do something else. But whatever you do, you have to do with passion. And secondly, is of course, nothing comes easy. So I think hard work is really important. But if you do hard work in area that you are passionate about, you don't feel that you are doing. So I think uh, perhaps uh, no, passion and hard work are the things that. Uh, yeah, maybe these these two words I can use. Yeah, work and play do not have to be uh, disparate. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor, uh, for this wonderful session, and thanks to our audience for tuning in. Uh, we hope to see you all in our future episodes.